utilize technology. Um, definitely look at precision livestock technology that you can implement. Obviously, there are behavioral precursors to tail biting. That's really what we're looking at at the University of Minnesota right now is what are precursors to the behavior? What are things that can tell us that it's about to happen? Yes, we can provide preventative measures, but sometimes they prevent it and sometimes they don't. So being able to identify the stressors early on and identifying changes within the barn and things that are going to help us identify that tail biting quicker. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me on this week's episode is Courtney Archer. Courtney is a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. Courtney, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And if you would, why don't you start with an introduction for the audience? Perfect. Thank you for having me. Um, I am originally from West Texas, Lubbock specifically. I received my bachelor's and master's at Texas Tech University, and then I was given the opportunity to come up north to the University of Minnesota and get my PhD. Well, you have definitely made a uh, minor climate jump, Courtney, but we appreciate you coming up here into the Midwest. And I know in your PhD work, you've been working on tail biting, uh, uh, an old problem for pig producers and one that continues to plague us. So talk to us a little bit about tail biting, right? Why is it important that we understand it? What the heck causes pigs to want to chew each other's tails? What, what are you working on and why is tail biting so important? Yeah, so tail biting is a big problem that we have been on lately. Um, and as you said, it's been a problem that's been going on for a while. Um, it's obviously a welfare concern, uh, but it also becomes a very much an economic concern for our food producers. Um, so when we do see tail biting out in our barn, first, obviously, we're going to see wounds, we're going to see blood, we're going to see abscesses. This is going to cause a lot of pain and injury to the pig which is then going to increase the stress level of our pigs. And so with our pigs being a lot more stressed, we're definitely going to see a lot more behavioral problems within the pen. But specifically, we're going to definitely see a reduced growth rate. So our pigs who are being tail bitten, they're going to be stressed. We're going to see a lower feed efficiency. We're going to see a lower feed intake. So these pigs are going to grow a lot slower. And so once these kind of do get to our market weight, they're not going to be as economically stable as our pigs who are not tail bitten. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boring or Ingelheim representative to learn more. And so, so that'll be the situation that even if we can fix the tail bite, we still see performance losses in that individual pig or those, those pigs that suffered from it, even after we don't see the lesions anymore. Is that what I hear you saying? Correct. Yes. Even though you might have tail biting like a one week outbreak issue and you heal those pigs and get them back, you are going to see long-term effects within their feed efficiency and their feed intake. Yeah. And that makes sense, Courtney. Um, talk to us about uh, root causes. Um, so I know you, you kind of highlighted stress there. Um, what uh, are there particular stressors or is there a particular set of stressful coincidences that happen together that drive tail biting? Is it predictable or really can it be any stressful event in the pig's life might result in a, a vice-like behavior like tail biting? Yeah, so the reason why tail biting has been such an issue for a long time is because it is a multifactorial issue. Essentially, anything within the barn that is going to cause stress within the pig can potentially cause tail biting. So we can see environmental stressors, we can see management stressors, handling social factors. Um, there's a variety of that could happen that could cause tail biting and that's why it's been so hard to be able to resolve this issue for our farmers. Very good. Well, it's hard, it's multifactorial, but we got to do something about it. So what are the things that you're looking at from a management strategy uh, perspective? What options do producers have to try and make this situation better? 
Yeah, so one go-to that uh, farmers can look at is impl implementing environmental enrichment and good environmental enrichment. So we're talking about toys or tools that are manipulable, that pigs can destroy, move around, interact with. But then it's also important to kind of add variety and rotation to your enrichment tools because pigs have the ability to habituate. And so you put enrichment uh, toys or tools within the pen, the pigs might use them for a little bit, but then they'll get bored of them pretty quick. And then the tools and toys are no good anymore. I think you bring up a great point, and it's one I hear from producers a lot, is that pigs get habituated to the tools and toys. It's no different than having kids for anybody who has kids, right? Christmas morning, everything's super excited, and by Christmas afternoon, uh, the toys are all in a pile, and I opened those this morning and I already played with them. What can producers do, um, Courtney, to try and identify when they're going to have the stress events or when they're going to have the tail points or tail bites and try to optimize when they place those enrichment tools? Um, that's a very good question. I would say that instead of trying to identify when those stressors are going to occur, you want to try to prevent because even if you kind of have, if you have a stressor, add the enrichment tool to um, mitigate or reduce the tail biting, but you still might have some a little bit. And so by preventing, that would be a better strategy than waiting to see when you need to implement. Courtney, what about uh, enrichment tools? Do you have any practical uh, cost effective tools that producers can look at that you'd recommend? Um, things that I have noticed that work a little bit better. And again, making sure to rotate these and having variety. Don't just keep using the same enrichment tools. Um, the pork chews are very effective. The easy flex, um, jack tools are very good. Um, any odor as well, pheromones and impl implementing those into the pen will work pretty well because the pigs can sniff, they can root around, things like that. Um, just trying to find two or three solid enrichment tools that just work for your farm that are cost effective and just rotate will be good. What about preventing the stress? What about low hanging fruit there? Um, as you as you go visit facilities that are having issues with tail biting, are there any per, per predictable stressors that you walk into and you're like, ah, oh, we don't need to have this stressor here, right? This is easy to fix. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Any tips for producers there on low hanging fruit on stressors that they can and need to remove from their pig's environment right now? Yeah, so some stressors that I see um, that do have kind of more of a directional um, effect of tail biting is just double check that your nutrient, uh, your feed is balanced. We definitely can see tail biting. Something that will happen too is just make sure that there's plenty of feeder space for your pigs. A lot of farmers say that what can happen is they see tail biting when there's not enough feeder space and you have a Smaller pigs start biting the tails of pigs at the feeder, trying to find space so that they can eat. Um, so make sure that there's ample resources for each pig within the pen. Yeah, you, I think you, you bring up a great point there, Courtney. Um, I have uh, very crassly used the statement, you've got a tail bite to move people sometimes. And I learned that from simply watching groups of growing pigs eating, right? You can literally watch it happen when they're, you know, the in front of that feeder is nothing but a bunch of pig butts, right? That's all you can see from the backside because they are lined up in there and that trough is totally full of pig. And you've got that next wave of pigs waiting behind them. They're standing there. They want their turn to to eat. And I think lines are stressful for anybody, right? When you're waiting in line to do anything, it's a, it's a stressful situation. And you just see those pigs eventually start to bite that tail, right? And they're just like, all right, your time's up. It's my turn. It's my turn. And I say that crassly that you get a tail bite to move people, but it's the reality of what pigs do in that situation. And, um, you know, nutritionists and vets pretty notoriously uh, get get after each other. I was taught once by an awesome nutritionist. I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Aaron Gaines. He's like, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what I put in this diet if the pigs can't get to it. 
And we were standing in a finisher barn that was way overstocked and it was 110 degrees outside. And, you know, I mean, the the pigs weren't eating, but maybe six hours a day in the middle of the night because it was so warm, right? We were in the middle of summer and there simply was not enough feeder space for all of those pigs to eat what they needed to eat in that six hour period. So if you're thinking about the nutrition side, I think you bring up a great point. Don't just go immediately blame the diets. We should review those, but typically diets are formulated perfectly. It's just the access piece, right? You know, and, and those diets are formulated, assuming the pigs have ad libitum access, the growing pigs have ad libitum access to the feed. But that's not always the case. Any last words of advice for producers, veterinarians, nutritionists that are listening to this, Courtney, to help manage tail biting? I would say the last piece of advice is um, utilize technology. Um, definitely look at precision livestock technology that you can implement. Obviously, there are behavioral precursors to tail biting. That's really what we're looking at at the University of Minnesota right now is what are precursors to the behavior? What are things that can tell us that it's about to happen? Yes, we can provide preventative measures, but sometimes they prevent it and sometimes they don't. So being able to identify the stressors early on and identifying changes within the barn and things that are going to help us identify that tail biting quicker. Excellent. Courtney, that's very good information, practical. Appreciate you coming on the show and sharing it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, thanks to our audience for letting us make this happen. Um, if you haven't gone to the website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com. Check out what we've got going on there. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do so. Um, that way you catch up uh, on not, not only Courtney's episode here, but every episode we put out. For Courtney Archer, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for joining us, and please have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.